We're talking this morning again in the book of Philippians, and we're going to start with chapter 1, verse 12. It's supposed to go through 26, but I might get through verse 1. And the reason is because this thing is so rich, like all scripture, it's rich. So sorry, y'all, that's the way it is. Holy Spirit leads me, and I do what he tells me to do. Amen. <clears throat> He starts in verse 12, and he says, I want you to know. Now, this is Paul. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, remember, he's writing to the Philippians from prison. He's in a Roman prison again. Don't know exactly where he's writing from. Just said it's a Roman prison. Could be any number in any number of cities. So he wants you to know. He wants them to know. He wants them to be aware of the situation. He's giving witness. The man's in prison, and he's given witness. Don't tell me that you can't be impressed with Paul, or don't tell me that you don't like Paul. Here's a man that loved Jesus Christ so much that in prison, he's witnessing. He's telling you about how good life is in prison. And we complain about everyday stuff. God, I, I better quit. I don't want to get. I don't want to get going there too too much. But he went on to say, "What has happened to me has really served." To advance the gospel. Now, being in prison, how in the world can you advance the gospel? Practically speaking, what in the world are you going to do? How can you make that happen? How can you make it work? Being in prison, advance the gospel. Ask yourself that question. Put yourself in his place. Walk in those shoes for just a minute. What are you going to do to advance the gospel? Now, the Greek word that is used there, the verb, um, it denotes making headway in spite of blows or uh, making progress in spite of strong opposition. He's getting beat up. And Lord, he is. You ever feel like that sometimes in your life? You feel like you get beat up? And this whole world, I bet y'all do sometimes. Some of y'all going through suffering, trial, tribulation. I know y'all feel like you get beat up. I have felt that way before. I'm sure y'all have. So you can identify with Paul to a certain degree. It was also used as a military term, moving obstructions, such as rocks and trees. You know, we've got a God who moves rocks and trees for us. He makes our way straight. When it doesn't look like there's any kind of way, he makes a way. How many times, I bet you if we took time this morning, we could take the whole class, next week's class, and we could talk about the rocks and trees, the obstructions in each of our lives that God moves for us. Our God, he is real, and there is nothing mm -hmm. that he can't do. There is no obstruction. There is no rock. There is no obstacle that we can't get through. We think we can. God bless us. But our God is able. Mm -hmm. What was it on Michael Holland used to They used to quote that scripture. <coughs> My arm's not too short to say. Think about that. Whatever it is that's coming at you, God's arm is not too short. The Lord clears our paths. Y'all believe that this morning. Paul did not view difficulty with self-pity. He did not sympathize with himself. He didn't take a minute and think, oh, man, this is bad. We do that. It's human condition. Paul didn't do it. He is our example of what we ought to be. Move beyond that self-pity. We love to get parked there. I'm talking to me. I love to do that. Love to get, love to get in a situation where I'm just, hold on. Pull me, but don't do it. Paul is our example. If you're focusing on you, then practically speaking, what happens? You can't be focused on your brother and your sister. Those prayers that you need to be lifting up. Come on in, Brenda and Mrs. Pan. Happy to see y'all this morning. If you're focusing on yourself, you're not going to be praying for somebody who needs praying. You're not going to be thinking about how you can minister in this kingdom that kingdom of God that we've got here that we're in right now that God formed you in this time to do a work for him you wonder what you're doing sometimes you wonder what your purpose is don't ask me I'll tell you doing his work for him right now and you may think that's a simplistic answer but I'm telling you it's not do not focus on me focus on what God has got for you to do and if you don't have something to do ask him and he'll give it to you one of the wonderful things about being part of this church, you don't have to worry about it. If there's something that I can do, God's got something for you right here. But apart from that, all you got to do is reach out. 
and it's that close to you, what you could be doing and working. God <laughs> means, do not focus on yourself. You know, I thought I was retired back in 16. Yeah, right. You know how many times I turned on the TV last week? And this is not about me, and I'm not talking about me. It's the same for all of us, I know. All you guys sitting here, I know y'all busy working. Didn't turn the TV on one time. God doesn't give me time. <clears throat> but it's wonderful. Working for God is wonderful. We talked about that. The blessing that God gives us for being busy in his kingdom. It goes beyond talking about. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be busy in this kingdom than sit and watch TV in it. There's nothing I'd rather be doing than what God has got for me to do because it carries a pleasure and a joy that the world, what is it Charles used to tell us? A joy the world cannot strip away from you. Cannot take it away from you. All this happy stuff that we do, all this stuff that we do to make ourselves happy, to find some kind of pleasure, is a waste of time. When you compare it with what God has got for us, with the joy that God brings and gives to us. Now tell me I'm wrong. I dare you. <laughs> Paul was not concerned how circumstances affected him. He was always asking the question, how can I find a way to proclaim the gospel? When you read about Paul, the sense that I get in Acts and in his epistles, that man was busy all the time. If he wasn't preaching, he was going someplace to preach. The times when he had a break, they were throwing him in jail. And what did he do when he was in jail? He was writing letters. They were singing hymns and praising and getting broke out of jail. And God was sitting here and yonder, preaching, teaching, spreading the word, establishing, building that church that we enjoy today because of the work that Paul did. I don't like Paul. I, I, I hear that and I give me a break. The church exists today in great part because of Paul. You know, what he got, what he did for the Lord. The Lord used him. The Lord used him mildly. Yes, ma'am. Um, I knew Paul was in prison and he was sharing the gospel with the guard, who are pretty much a captive audience. But in reading through this, um, I just assumed there was the daytime guards and the nighttime guards and then the same old daytime guards. But they're suggesting that maybe they change guards every four hours. So here he's got six times every 24 hours, he's got new people that he can share the gospel with. Um, Today, when you're in a military and you do a guard detail, they change guards every four hours. So there you go. Where do you reckon they learned it from? From the Romans. Yeah, because the Romans did a whole lot of stuff right. <laughs> Ain't that true, right? Yeah. yeah. So Paul saw a beginning in what some call an end. Huh? We're done. That's the end of it. I'm in jail. Nothing I can do. Uh -uh. That wasn't Paul's attitude. It wasn't. It ought to be ours. He walked. He walked. He made a door open. He found a door he could get through. Couldn't find a door. He found a window. He went through the window. That's how Paul was. God is able to take bad circumstances and turn them around. If we don't hear anything else this morning, please hear that. God is able to take any set of circumstances and turn them around. I know that personally in my own life. I can tell you story after story, and I bore you to death, and you think this is about what we're It's not. God, our Lord, Yahweh, there is no situation that he can't turn around. I don't care what it is. He's able. His arm is not too short. So we're all going through tough times in here. Some of y'all are tougher than others, and I know that, and I don't make light. Of those, please don't think for a moment that I do. I do not. But there is no situation or set of circumstances that we don't get through if we belong to the Lord. He loves us. He's got a place for us. He's going to make a place for us here and now and in time to come. He's got us in his hand. We ain't going nowhere apart and separated from God. Nothing. What's scripture say? What can snatch us out of here? Not a thing. Uh uh. You're safe in his hands. I love the scripture where the Lord says he covers us with his wings. When he describes what he does for us, like a mother hen. Have you seen a mother hen? It's the coolest thing in the world. I don't care what comes at that mother hen. I don't care how big, how bad it is. Mama gathers those chickens. I've seen the biggest, baddest, meanest pit bull you ever seen in your life go after a mother hen, and she'll stand right up to them. Give her life. If that's what it takes, but she gathers those hands out of her wings. Our God gathers us that same way. He covers you 
that same way. He's got you. It's a common phrase. Now. He's got you. You belong to him. You're his. You're the sheep of his pastor. He created you. He knows you. He gave you a name. Unique to you. God is able. He takes the bad and he makes it good. So, where was your hope yesterday? Where is your hope today? Is it sagging? Does it get weak sometimes? Don't let it. Remember. Remember what God does for you. Remember what his word says. He said, just to remind you, I'll never leave you or I'll forsake you. He said, nothing is impossible for God. How many times did he say that scripture? A bunch of times. I love when he said it to Mary when he was in Edgar was there announcing uh, the birth of the Lord Jesus. Is it nothing impossible for God? The immaculate conception, the Holy Spirit on this world to give birth to the Son of God. Nothing is impossible for our Lord. At this present time has become insane. We keep talking about that. But you know, just as with Paul's circumstances and the circumstances you all have already been through and that you will go, God bless us, we're going to continue to suffer as long as we live this life. Just as that is, God is sovereign. Ain't none of it happening apart from what he knows and what he does. Just as with Paul, his hand is providentially working all the time. Here's what scripture says in Isaiah. For the Lord Almighty has purpose, and who can thwart him? It's a rhetorical question because, of course, no one can thwart Yahweh, the master of the universe, God Almighty. It ain't happening today, tomorrow, no time. Scripture goes on to say in Job 42, which we just studied, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. Here's a man in the midst of suffering, but he still had sense enough to know, well, I'm sure Holy Spirit works doing. You can do all things. I know that you can do all things, that, that no purpose of yours can be corrupted. That's in Job 42. Some elements of God's plan are going to happen in a lifetime. We've talked about many times already. Uh, some of going to happen after we pass. We don't always receive those promises today, but they're coming, and we can take pleasure and, and assurance in that. Others of his uh, uh, blessings, they're going to occur way down the road. It just, that's God's plan. Psalm 31, 11 states, the plans of the Lord, however, stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart for all generations. What a blessing. Now, God's plan does not begin and end with a single person. His plans Span centuries. We see that. We know that. We can look back. We have the blessing of being able to look back and see that his plan has gone on from time before and goes on now. It's got a happy ending. We know how it is. Good stuff. I want to tell y'all a story this morning because it's very appropriate because of <coughs> Paul's writing from jail. Yeah, I told y'all I was in school. There's a young lady who's in there. She's probably 19 or 20 years old. She's Eritrean. She's uh, been in America for about uh, eight or nine or 10 years or so. Uh, born and was in Eritrea until about age 10. Her family was a part of an underground church. Eritrea, I don't know if y'all ever been there or not, is not a very happy place. No offense to the Eritreans. They got what they got. Eritrea is in the Horn of Africa. I <coughs> digress a moment. It's uh, bordered by Djibouti, by Sudan, and by Ethiopia. I've been to Djibouti. I would describe it to y'all a couple of times and not to belabor it, but we refer to it as the armpit of the world for a lot of reasons. Uh, just give you one understanding of it so you kind of get a feel for where she's coming from. We walked through downtown Djibouti one day, and everybody chews a substance there called cat. Looks kind of like asparagus, if you're generous, we'll do description. And you look into somebody's eyes and they're not there. You ever do that before? You look at somebody's eyes and they're not there? 99.9% .9 from the youngest youngin to the oldest citizen that you'll see, chewing that stuff. And it's high most of the day. Plane gets there about 10 o'clock in the morning, bringing the cat from I think Jim, I can't remember now exactly. I used to know all that stuff. But anyway, it's not important. The people who brought the cat in and sold it at great profit to their own citizen was the wife of the president of the country. That's how much they love their people. The GDP, the gross domestic product in Ethiopia, the time I was there, and that was in like 2006, 
was somewhere between $300 and $350 a year because people don't work. They're high on cap all the time. Djibouti, Eritrea, Sudan, all that area choose cap is what they do. It's for them how they get through life. That young lady came from that environment. Underground church. Her father was a preacher and a teacher. They got locked up. They're in prison. She's 10 years old. Uh, predominantly Muslim country. Christians are very heavily persecuted in that country. And it has communist roots. There's just nothing good about it. So she said, looking us in the eye, that there was a young girl, four years old, in prison room. She said they were in a particularly desperate situation. They were being beaten. And I'm not going to describe to you in detail what happens to young ladies in a situation like that. But they experienced all of that multiple times, many days on end. A little girl, four years old, she gets up and she gets in a position where everybody can see her and she starts singing hymns, mm -hmm. praising God, mm -hmm. and lifted them up out of the mud and the mire. We put a new song just as the psalm says, in their heart and their mouth. Gave them the strength to go on another hour. Mm. 17 years, that young lady's father is still in prison because as I said, he was a Christian, uh, uh, a teacher and a pastor. Underground church is still there. Don't know how many people in the underground church. The church goes on. Gates of hell will not prevail against that church because a four-year-old little girl has got the Holy Spirit in her, lifting her up, giving her the strength to sing a song when all around her is chaos and perdition. And you and I have the gall to complain about our circumstances. And all the circumstances, I, mean, I love y'all, I ain't tolerant. And I want you to think about that story next time before you complain. Okay? That little girl, well, I know it's still over there. She'd be about 14 right now. Still living in that. And we're Christians and we're sitting here and we complain about things that are absolutely inconsequential. We got first world problems <laughs> and we equate them with people who live in the third world and are struggling to survive. And Christians, Christians who love the name of the Lord so much they're willing to die, give their life for it, and we sit here and complain. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the rest of those folks out there. <laughs> All right. And we need to think about that. We do. That young lady, she's sitting in Bible college. She is using her life to get smart about the things that you and I take for granted. I ain't no excuse for our behavior and worthy act sometimes some things come up out of my mouth. I wonder the God that reached down and I shall teach everybody's head well. <clears throat> so I love y'all. I just want to share that with y'all. It got my attention. I heard it from the horse's mouth. No offense to that young lady. She's a very lovely young lady. She will likely never see her family again. But she's singing God's praises. You've never seen somebody so fired for the Lord. Don't you know what incredible things God's going to do with her? Do with that witness of her? Hmm. Wants to do the same thing with you and me. Yes, he does. So, I still got 10 minutes. Ain't y'all table. <laughs> she was forged in a fire. That young lady was forged in the fire. It's going to be amazing what our God does with her. So what does scripture tell us about our relationship with the Lord? Ought to be now. Paul loved God. Didn't he? Oh my goodness. He's praising him in jail. You know that man loved God. You love God that much. Scripture tells us how much we all love God. We say it all the time. So I know y'all know the answer to it. But do you love him that much? Do you? Ask yourself. What does your life reflect? Does it reflect you loving the way you're supposed to love it? In Mark 12, there's some discussion about this. As Jesus is getting close to the time they're going to crucify him, he says, which command is that old Pharisee is going to test him? Which command is most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And this part, we have a real hard time with here. <laughs> You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know about y'all, but that one gives me the day. Yeah, it does. I'm being honest this morning. I have to pray about it every morning and throughout the day. <laughs> Good. 
Station temperature, I'm telling you. <laughs> I know, and, and, and as bad as I think somebody may be, I know I'm worse. I know people have a hard time with their feet. I got to do better. So, did you know that if you study the scripture and all three of the synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they have this account and they talk about loving God this much, all three. So, it's not just in the scripture one time, it's in three of the scriptures, and it's in three of the scriptures where the men knew the Lord or knew men who knew the Lord. So you think it's important that we love God that much? How important do you think it is? It's in the scriptures. Excuse me, I, I have to laugh at me because what does it take to get through to me? To understand that I need to love God with all that I am, with my entire being. And y'all do too. And even more you love your brothers yourself. How hard is that? So, from three perspectives, with emphasis on that important element of our relationship with God, loving Him with all that we are, He reminds of, of, us of what's written in Scripture. It's written there three times because He doesn't want us to miss it. Three times. I want y'all to see what it is that you need to be doing in your relationship to God. Three times. Leviticus 19.18. Now, that's just the New Testament. I ain't done. Leviticus 19. Here's what the word says. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against any of your people. But what? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it finishes with, I am the Lord. And that's kind of like saying, I'm telling you what you need to be doing. Lord God Almighty, Master of the Universe, Yahweh himself. I am the Lord. Love your neighbor. Love me with all that you am, with all that you are. Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. People say the Old Testament is not relevant today. For whatever reason, these identity groups, they don't like what Scripture has to say, so they want to change it or they want to negate it. Say, give me a break. What rag, rational, logical person thinks Scripture is not relevant today? What rational, logical, intelligent person can know from looking at the stars that God is alive, he created it all, but what he said is not relevant. That's like a little baby saying to his mom and daddy, you're not relevant to me. No, it's even worse than that. It's even worse than that. Tell me I'm wrong. So, there you go. It's in the Old Testament and it's in the New Testament. So I reckon it's important. And what did Jesus say? New, some folks, they said in the New Testament and they don't bother with the Old Testament, and that's just as foolish as people deny that it has relevance. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill the law. Every John Till to fulfill the law. We got it in the Old Testament New Testament. You cannot ignore it. So if you're not loving God the way you need to be loving him, and I told you how you need to do it. Y'all are smart people. You don't, have to, you don't need to take that love God. But you better be doing it. You know the biggest reason you ought to be doing it because you're missing such a doggone blessing if you don't be loving him the way that God said to love. Him. He has such wonderful good blessings and stuff for us. Not stuff. You know what I mean. Um, in a relationship, the blessing of a wonderful relationship with a God who gives us peace in the midst of terrible times, which we're in right now. So there is, I, I had read this some time ago and it really it got my attention. You know, there are the Hasidic Jews, um, they revere God so much that they won't say his name. They won't say Yahweh. They revere him that much. How much do you love God? How much do you revere God? You revere him that much? You know, some folks look down on Jewish people. And that is such a foolish thing to do. That is such a foolish thing to do. They will not speak the name of Yahweh because they revere that name so much. Many times they will refer to him as master of the universe. How cool is that? Someone loves you so much, someone respects you so much, that they won't even refer to you by your actual name. <clears throat> they refer to you by some other name so as to demonstrate that respect. That's cool. But you know what else? What I just read to you, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's referred to by Jewish folks as a Shema. And they have had it, a habit, pious Jewish folks, Hasidic Jews saying that at least twice a day. 
And their thing is that they want to die when their time comes with those words on their lips. Think about that a minute. What an incredible love for God. Now, we want them to have Christ in their hearts. Don't misunderstand me. However, what wonderful reverence for the Lord God Almighty that we could learn a lesson from those folks. There's this gentleman who lived in the 18th century. His name was Adam Parks, commentator, godly man. Some folks like his commentary, some don't. I found a, a part that I really like talking about uh, the first command, the first and the greatest command. He said the following. It is in its antiquity being as old as the world and a grave originally on our very nature. God doesn't leave us to ourselves. He makes us to know. He said, I will write my law in your heart, in your mind. And that's what uh, the Reverend Clark is referring to. It is referring to this commandment. It is in its dignity as directly and immediately proceeding from and referring to God, a great reverence and awe for the Lord God. It is in its excellence being the commandment of the new covenant and the very spirit of the divine adoption. All the law and the prophets are wrapped up in that commandment. It's important. It is in its justice because it alone renders to God his due, prefers him before all things. Are you preferring God before all things? Is he most important to you and most important in your life? And he goes on. That scripture, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, is so important to our lives. Don't let it slip. What did the Lord establish in the garden of Adam and Eve? The Lord God who loves us. He established a mutually loving relationship between himself and Adam and Eve. They sinned. We like to bad mouth them, give Adam a hard time, and then, you know, then we make jokes about, well, that woman you gave in. We particularly like to give Eve a hard time. Sometimes we don't say it, but we feel it in our hearts. That's kind of ridiculous because we'd have done the same thing, you know, <clears throat> probably. You may say, no, I wouldn't have. Yeah, I wouldn't take your bets on it. So what was there in Noah's relationship? Adam and Eve, the garden's gone. They blew it. Here comes Noah. God had a special relationship with him, saved him and his family. What happened? They immediately went out and sinned. Man blew it again. you got to love God with your heart, full heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when you don't do it, you're going to fall. That happens. With Abraham, God did it again. He established a covenant. He had a special relationship with Abraham, called him his friend. There was such a love between or for from on the part of Abraham for God that he was willing to give up his only son. God didn't require that. But that love was there. Special relationship, special covenant. That love that Abraham might have. You think it was like this love? Heart, soul, mind, and strength? I think it was. I think it's that same kind of love. We need to take an example from that. Where the children of Israel, God brought them out of that oppressive state, 400 years of slavery. He brought them to Sinai. He blessed them. He loved them with his whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. So he do this. Well, they blew it. He sent his son. His love for us is so great. You know, in Old Testament scripture, when it talks about the covenants, there are two Greek words, and I won't go into the two Greek words, except to say that they mean uh, that his love is steadfast, it lasts, and it's it's a part of that being faithful, and that love goes on and on and on and on. His love is steadfast and faithful. Faithful and steadfast. What does the scripture tell us the kind of love that we ought to have? Same kind of love. If you go to uh, excuse me, Galatians 5, 22, it talks about being full of the fruit of the Spirit, and we've talked about it many times. Uh, I'm sorry, my time is way up. I'm going to go. Y'all got places to go and people to see. Love y'all. Appreciate y'all being here. Too much to talk about it all today. We'll have to do it again next week. I um, want to pray for y'all before you go, but I want y'all to know before you leave today, we pray for y'all every day. And I know that y'all pray for each other. And my encouragement to you is keep on doing that praying because God hears our prayers. He protects us and he keeps us. And you think, ah, I'm going through this crazy time. 
Yeah, please don't get to it. Let's pray. Father, please have mercy on your people. Please protect them and keep them. Lord, let this plague not come near our tents. Some of us, it already has. Please continue to heal and have mercy and bless and keep. But for the rest of us, we pray, Father, please uh, prevent this plague from coming near our tents. I pray, Lord, that you will protect your people in all ways. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with their families, their extended families, their children, grandchildren, brothers, sisters, wives, husbands. Lord, have mercy on your people, we pray. We're not afraid to ask you, Father, because you told us to. So please, have mercy. Lord, thank you for all you've done for us. For those you've healed, oh, Father, how great you are. How great you are that you've heard our prayers. Every prayer, every Sunday, every day, Lord, you hear us. We give you thanks. Now, as these people go, Lord, please have mercy on them. Protect them. Keep them. Bring them back next week. Nudge them, Father. Don't let them not come. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all come back.